Benza. Um, those by that, if you're familiar with Bankhoof and kind of street artist name, and so you think of it along those lines. Um, I'm going to let each of them, rather than take up too much time, tell more about where they come from. But I, I know Jenka's work from having seen these amazing um, virtual reality masks to use as a high fire, high, high intense heat, uh, ancient Japanese method of firing to make these masks and this combination of futurist and uh, historical uh, traditions was really fascinating. She has a line that covers the history of virtual masks that have virtual reality goggles. So starting with uh, Sword of Damocles, maybe even earlier to you know the current Vive and, and gear. Um, sitting next to her is Ed Button, who is uh, a photographer, director of, oops, sorry, we're out of order. Here we go. Ed Button, yes, you were being interviewed there. Um, he was director of photography for Doug Lyman's VR series, Invisible. Are people here familiar? Could I see a show of hands of people are familiar with that at all? No, okay, so we're gonna have an interesting thing. Uh, down further on the table is Lauren Fitzsimmons, who uh, Ed suggested since she was going to be able to be here at the conference, join us on the panel, and she is the production designer for that project. Um, Tino, as we see, ha is uh, head of design. He's a partner in both Optimist and United Realities. Um, fantastic uh, art direction credentials, and I knew him more by that and learned uh, only maybe less than a year ago that he was actually doing the very incredible VR music videos and commercials. But he's also got an interest and background in architecture, and we're going to start talking more about the physical space, the physicality of VR. And I think I covered everyone, so what I'm going to do is hand this over. I guess I should tell you who I am. So <laughs> to me, I have my background was in independent video and art. I actually have a fine arts degree and started playing around with installations and uh, really breaking out of the frame as it was in, in a small private New England art school. Rolled over into doing single channel videos, um, commercials, ended up working at ABC. <laughs> on E! Entertainment, <coughs> among other television networks, and then spent 10 years with the American Film Institute developing their, at first, what was called the Enhanced TV Workshop, uh, AFI-Intel Enhanced TV Workshop, became their digital media lab. So it's a, uh, not checkered, but harlequin past of art, video production, and uh, history and design. I teach a course called New Directions in electronic digital media. Interestingly enough, the catalog puts digital in parentheses, and some of my students are here. It's a wonderful, interesting course. With that, I'm going to call Zanka up and allow her to drive herself. It's better than a self-driving car. <laughs> <laughs> if you need, if it gets wonky, the best. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, today I'm going to introduce you to the world of augmented reality. Augmented reality in terms of headsets is a little bit further behind than virtual reality. Uh, however, it's kind of a low-hanging fruit because as you just saw, you can do it with your tablet and you can do it with your cell phone. So in a way, it makes a really great companion tool for people creating in VR because you can do postcards that are promoting your, your films or your VR work um, and you can use it in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of how I do creations from custom apps to a phone app that you guys can use today and start creating stuff. Uh, and we're going to get into the practical part of it. First, I want to show you what people are doing with augmented reality. And onto information everywhere. So we're moving into information everywhere. Um, of course, architects are having a field day with it. Um, this is an amazing app that, that translates in real time. Um, into another language, because you can walk around with your phone. IKEA has been using the technology for a very long time, because you can see how the things move. You can see how the drawers move, and you can't see that from a regular picture. You can also see how it would look in your house. Lego 
puts a monitor in the toy store, the kids walk up with a box and they Magic can see what's going to look like. Magic Leap built around something called a dynamic Magic Leap um, is one of the companies that Google has invested very heavily in that are working on glasses that actually project into your retina. So your brain can't tell the difference between what's real and what's coming in. And you're going to have a virtual desktop. You're going to have as many monitors you're going to want. You're going to relate to things with your gestures and your voice. Computers are finally going to be intuitive, and your grandparents are going to be able to use it in a way that's natural. This is awesome. You can walk up to a screen, not have to try anything on. Yeah, it's like I'm right there. Oh, um, like Lowe's has invested this heavily. Cool. You know, they oh, have a market no, case because it saves people <laughs> millions it's of dollars. You know, in because they can actually see how the things are going to look before they remodel. A vision of how HoloLens Microsoft is also working on HoloLens, subject. and this is an application they're using <clears throat> for sharing things and also for education. Um, also, augmented reality can be projected on a space. So this is um, you know, a sandbox that people can walk in. They can actually move the sand up and down, and then the augmented reality projects the different layers. So there's different platforms that make it easy for people to create augmented reality, and these are some of them. Um, the first one I want to tell you about is made by HP. Um, it's called Erasma. They bought a company called Erasma, and you can install it on your phone today and start creating things to show your friends and making them <laughs> see magic again. The thing that you have to, um, the only two terms that you have to remember is trigger, and overlay. So the trigger is like my painting. That's what happens when the camera sees that trigger, it goes do something. The overlay is what's overlaid on top. You can overlay whatever you want. You can overlay a video that has transparency. You can over overlay a 3D image, or you can overlay a flat image. So this is how easy it is. Um, in the first thing, you select the 3D animation that you want. On the next screen, you pick the image. And the image, the trigger image, needs to be something solid, you know? Not a person's face that's going to move around, but just sort of a solid image. Then you position the overlay there. You save it, you add it to a channel, and you share it with your friends. They also have an online site called Erasma.com um, where you can create a studio account, which is not connected to your phone um, work, but you, you have it as separately. And again, you don't have to program. This is like the most exciting revolution because all this technology is coming down into the hands of everyday people so we can make really important, heartfelt, fun stuff. And this is how easy it is. Upload a trigger image, position it. Um, you can have different um, layers. You, know, you can have it stop and start so you can add a little bit of interactivity. You can add it to a channel. And again, you can share it with your friends. Channels are ideas like if someone's not joined to your channel, they're not going to be able to see your work. So you have to make sure that, that you do that step. This is all the free software that you can use. Erasma Blender has 3D objects. On my website, I teach you how to bring in 3D objects into that software. Then, of course, there's custom app development. So if you want to make a custom app that has a little bit more interactivity or does things that um, uh, that you don't have to join the channel, which is a very complicated step to explain to people. So when they can just open their phone, install your app, and boom, go, that's great. But it involves a little, it involves more of a team. So I'm going to take you through the steps. This is the most important step. <laughs> uh, you guys all know that. You've heard it, content's king, content's king, content's king. If you don't have a good idea, it's not, it's, you know, keep thinking. Um, I'm going to take you through a, a concrete example. Um, I was asked to turn um, a high-tech um, office in San Francisco to make it come to life. So I decided to take the murals that were there, the artwork was there, and just add on augmented reality to that. Um, then you have to think, what is the hardware? Are people going to use it on their phone? They wanted to do headsets. So a lot of these um, virtual reality headsets that you, like cardboard ones, you can put your phone in and there's a pass-through hole so the camera can actually work. So these things can be used for augmented reality and virtual reality. So they wanted to use the Samsung Gear, they wanted to use Merge, and they wanted to use tablets and phones. So that was something that we had to deal with. 
was I going to use an existing app or custom app? Like I said, I needed to do custom. I wanted it to be easy, and I needed it to work with Merge and Samson. So you can create um, the postcard that I showed earlier. I just shot myself on green screen um, and overlaid on that. You have to create your 3D models, your app design, um, postcard signage. That's also important. How are you going to explain to people to get through this technical hurdle to get this app on their phone and see your stuff? So that's like the only limitation of, of augmented reality is getting people through that hump. Maybe you provide the tablet with it installed, but you definitely want to think about that. So when you program and work with it, leave yourself open to experimentation because, because this is a new field, you might bump in and do something that is really cool that you didn't know and you want to have your process open enough to find those things. Um, like I said, important to, uh, that people understand your instructions, test it on people who are not familiar with it, see if they can, they can do it. And you want to um, publish it. And you, this is also a really important step that a lot of people don't do. You've got to tell the story. So for the, all of the people who are too lazy to install your app or didn't get to the event or weren't there in person, you've got to tell your story using social media, using videos, using everything. And that's true for VR or AR. It's important to create an experience like that, that other people can, can do without, without it. So this is the end of my talk, and I'm just going to play um, a video of, of my experience for this project. out at 2,000 degrees and then put into to fire, to fire. So you can actually do particle animation. I don't know if you saw that, but we had clouds like fueling off of the, um, the mountains, which really was a great effect. Eventually, our VR and AR helmets will be reprogrammed with. of one world in many different realities and one of the ways that I like to distinguish, I'm going to hope we don't lose the projector here um, this kind of reality to me is to identify and augment and we're talking about enhancing the natural and physical physical world, I think that's one Yeah, okay. 
Okay. Well, it's just a bit. Let's see if this one might work for you. It's okay. I was only going to show, uh, I'm not going to get the chart, but I was only going to show like the first page of my visual research for this, for the project that I just did. Um, because unfortunately, like a lot of this, I can't show you anything, which makes getting your next job really hard. It's literally <laughs> invisible. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm not nearly as organized. Uh, but I'm going to just give a little bit of a talk about some of my thoughts on VR, and then I'm going to focus on, um, I'm doing projects within different areas of VR right now, but I'm going to focus for this pretty specifically on cinematic 360 narrative-driven video. Um, the project I just did was a series uh, not dissimilar to the structure of a television series, uh, but just shorter form and a different aspect to it. All right, so some thoughts about VR and the thinking in production, uh, specifically for narrative 360 video. Um, I, per think, I, prefer, I prefer to think of the challenges in VR in this aspect. I'm just gonna use the term VR. I kind of hate just using that term, but it's a mouthful to say 360 narrative video every time. So if you just bear with me on that one for a moment, uh, our terminology I'll discuss later. I prefer to think of the challenges in VR as opportunities, and for sure in this medium, you cannot cheat. You, it just doesn't work. Um, I don't think one should be, at this point, striving to do good enough work for it to work. I think we really need to be, since there's no benchmarks, we really have to strive to just do sort of the best project we can at all times and not think in, in terms of re reaching any benchmarks. Um, it's not incredibly complicated, but it does take incredible attention to detail. It's like deciding what you want to do first, then building a tool to do it, rather than the concept of uh, just taking a tool and deciding what to do with the tool. It's like drawing with code versus drawing with uh, Photoshop. With Photoshop, you're limited by the tool that you have. You, see, you pick up a pencil and now we're drawing, rather than saying, I want to draw, let's make a pencil and this kind of pencil. So it's a sort of, has to, I, I think, has to take on a little bit deeper thinking like that. Um, I'm currently, because uh, you, you only want to be limited by your imagination, not by this tool set in front of you, because the tool sets are changing, and there's just a problem with that. Um, I'm currently using everything I've ever learned, whether it be from cinematography to music to spatial media encoding to network thinking, and I think all of all of everything that you know about your craft in any aspect is all applicable. From a, th from a cinematography point of view, uh, on shooting cinematic 360 narrative VR, um, we do a lot of the same things we would do in traditional flat imaging, but I like to think of it as time six. Six times more cameras. The light is six times more important. The camera placement is six times more important. If you, place, if you place the camera in the wrong place, your presence and suspension of disbelief does not work as well. The neurologists have absolutely proven that, for example, with pre-visualization, using VR for like a quarterback to pre-vis, if the camera position is slightly off and not believable, the effect it has is only about 50% of what it is. If they get that camera position right, it doubles the effectiveness of the pre-visualization, and that's a neurology thing, or that's a brain thing. Um, your lighting. Lighting is crucial to storytelling, but um, it's, it's really crucial to choose locations where you can light or the light is in the proper place naturally. You can look at it in a way like you are lighting in your scalp. You're casting your locations. Um, you have to take that extremely seriously if you want to pull this off. Um, my mentor essentially was Emmanuel Lubezki, and he's a master of signing off on locations and camera positions where the light is correct naturally. Only sun is backlight. He can decipher a location to the point that there's no option for camera placement but the correct one. Uh, and you see it consistently again and again in his work that he will, can manipulate a location to the point where the only place to put it is the right place naturally. Uh, it, it's truly incredible, and I think that really applies to this medium. 
Um, the light absolutely has to tell a story. It can be unrealistic and 360 can absorb it, but it must have a point. It's, uh, at this point, I found uh, for this series, part of the process, it, it really lent itself to an overlit look. Um, and I think 360 can handle it. It's a lot like lighting for black and white. You create these big edge lights that would look really unrealistic in color, but it creates depth to your image. And it's a very, if you were to look at black and white photography in color, it looks very unrealistic. And if you were to light, and if you look at black and white that's been shot like color in a cinematic way, point of view, it's uh, very flat and mushy. And a lot of the complaints we have in, in cinematic 360 video is, gosh, it's flat and mushy. You know, so what if you, by dragging in that same concept of creating depth and controlling your eye through the light, you get a much deeper, more immersive, more interesting image in my, in this case, uh, as long as it's a choice. You have to have control of the choice. Um, and that has to do with the way our eyes work. Uh, the same is true in essence about how our eyes work with the HMDs and our ability to focus. If you think of pulling focus and the way our focus works naturally, it's very similar to that in that you're, you're changing focus, your eyes are moving in and out, focusing your lenses in your eye, and, but the image you're seeing is, is in one place and it's so close. So that's one of the reasons the seven minute mark works really well for this type of content is our eyes get tired. So all of these things, the physiology all starts to play into how you're focusing and how you're using actually your traditional techniques of telling a flat story. Um, this panel originally uh, is and was a little bit about some of the challenges. So uh, I would like to speak a little bit to some of the challenges on set in this specific type of production. You know, it's different when you're in a game engine, it's different when you're in AR. There's a million different areas that it can be, but in this situation, where you're producing, you're working in a sense with actors, sets, locations, scheduling, budgeting, all of those traditional elements, you need to have uh, a ton of communication. You need to have more communication with your creative departments on a much higher level. The link between production design, art department, costume, all of these creative departments is all critical. Again, six times more than in traditional media. Um, in this area, we need as much prep and pre-light time and decoration time and all that is possible. You cannot have enough prep time. That's something that's been very difficult to date because of budgets and not having so many people coming from so many different areas. Getting that to be understood and happen has been a process of discovery for a lot of people doing this work. Um, one example in the, this area, to, to sort of explain more what I mean is, is let's say, for example, color palette. Since we have camera systems that don't allow for much flexibility in grading at this point, we have to have a singular vision, let's say, for color palette on set because we, there's not, we've got to do a lot of it in camera. It's like we're shooting 2001 video. We've got to burn some in. There's not a raw image. There's, no, there's, no, there's, there's not like 17 stops of latitude on some of these cameras. Um, so you've got to have more communication with your departments to have those story points and to get that in there on set. So Ed, let me ask you, is, it, or is this kind of a, necessi a necessity for a language and aesthetic between the creative professionals and not just... Well, you have to have more, more communication, that. but yeah. and that sort of gets to my next point, is that there's a ton of technical conversation that happens, and we're not all yet using the same terms. And from a, a director of photography point of view, that takes time. And on set, your budget is your time. So you've got, you know, if you think of the old adage of like if you used to take a Polaroid to check your image, I, I, think, you, I think you back there taught me that one in Rockport. Somebody said this one. Uh, if you have to take a Polaroid to check your image, it takes two, two and a half minutes. On a, that's, if you add that up on every setup, it's a day a month. So on a small feature, you're losing a full day of shooting because you have to check the image. Now, imagine if that's not two minutes, that's 30 minutes of discussion or 45 minutes of discussion. I mean, your AD is blowing his brains out because we don't have, uh, we don't have the time to do that, especially when you've got a huge post cost and all of this. So getting these technical terms down, and I'm avoiding saying any of my ones I'm making up, 
but getting these technical terms down in the education across departments is incredibly important. Same with camera, camera department, for example. Uh, that's all got to get together, and it is getting together. It's absolutely going to be as we do this a couple of times. Everybody sees it. Some technical, some issues with the cameras, for example. So I'm going to move on. Yeah, a I'd like to segue a little bit, get Tina's stuff so that we can have a okay, discussion going on. Um, that. That's, thank you. Great. So uh, there's a lot of issues with cameras. There's, you have to, again, think of everything times six. It's very hard to control flare, very hard to, so lots of technical things in there. But from all of that, we just need more time, more more ability to practice it and you know it's exciting as hell it's really fun um, it's just a process of discovery and just on a final note uh, we should be viewing dailies like play testing not dailies we should be looking at cuts we, we, we need to embrace some of that other depart other media's way of functioning um, as well as VR cinematic VR must also embrace discovery not just ideation Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see if the projector is going to play nicely. Oh, yeah. I didn't even get to this. Yeah. Put visible at the end, you know, because I don't know what I can see. Okay, it's not working. He has to reboot. You have to reboot. We're kind of making them up, I think. Uh, not necessarily. Things are. It's it's just more everybody talking about the same thing. I I actually should be doing a blog about that, but there, it's coming together. There are proper terms. It's just it's not the information hasn't been disseminated enough. Um, so it's just taking time right now to figure this out. It's part of discovery. I have privileged views is actually a very interesting term. I, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, I mean, for sure, I'm doing things like panning scripts. You know, like uh, you know, where where is the viewer panning? What uh, you know, it's scripting out what we want them to be doing because you know you're not panning your camera, right? Um, I'm not. I, I mean, for sure, terms like we're forced proscenium is a good one. Uh, I, I, people seem to understand that term. Yeah, it would be great to have kind of a glossary. Well, nobody's talking about a little bit about uh, suspension of disbelief, right. which I, I, I find really interesting. They're talking about presence, but aren't they really the same thing? On some level, like we have to have sense of disbelief in order to be present. So I just, you know, I've never, heard, I've never heard one person talk about suspension of disbelief, and that is an applicable term that's been around. If you do it right, you don't need to suspend. Well, absolutely, but it's just like, for example, that's an applicable term that we already use and understand, and it's not even applied. Okay. Um, yeah. One second. So my name is Tino Schaedler. I'm a production designer uh, originally, um, and we started um, working with VR probably a year ago. And I guess what, you know, um, it probably all seems a little um, uh, discoherent or uncoherent, what, you know, what we're talking about, I guess, but uh, I guess the, the theme here is, um, and what's interesting for me is kind of that, you know, VR is so new and we're all kind of venturing into it and um, we all have, have our perspectives that we go into the process of exploration. So, you know, Ed is kind of a DP, so he looks at it from, from that perspective. Zenka is, a, is an artist and you know this we all have our perspectives and um, my perspective is the one of, um, of a production designer and also an architect and um, that's kind of you know I just realized also kind of I was on a, on a panel on, on Wednesday um, and kind of just you know through the discussions kind of realized that my <coughs> perspective always comes through space so just to give you a little bit of, of, of background um, 
I studied architecture and worked as an architect for three years after, the, after my master degree and then went into film design, worked on, to, on bigger movies like Harry Potter and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and then went into um, brand experience and brand design with my company Optimist about four years ago and all those stage or all those points really shaped um, my perception on, on design and, and for me VR is kind of the, the medium that where everything converges. Um, the reason being that in architecture you when you design architecture when you work in architecture uh, it's all about space and at you know the space that you create and there's you know you you think about how it will be for people to go into that space there's a spatial sensation um, that is really really like the key to I think great design um, it is about lighting about you know also shadow and and atmospheres that you create but in the end uh, all that kind of surrounds about the spatial experience like we're all sitting in this space right now and there's some sort of a um, kind of a sensation uh, in this space maybe less than in like a big cathedral you know like St. Paul or whatever I think for uh, the non-architects in you know I don't know if there is any architects but you know you, you might have that feeling better if you think of those more impressive spaces um, with film then, for me, the, the learning and the important thing was kind of to, to really be exposed to all these amazing artists that are working on different aspects and kind of shaping the atmospheres and, and everything that helps to tell the story. <coughs> Architecture is, is more about the space, film for me more about the storytelling. Um, and I learned a lot, you know, how the space and the, 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 the set design or the production design can really help to support that. Um, VR for me is kind of uh, basically a combination of, two, of the two in a different way uh, than both mediums, but you definitely have a space that you go into and you have a spatial sensation. You're sitting inside of a space as opposed to um, cinema where you basically sit in front of a screen and you can tell stories unlike in architecture, you really have a space that you can animate. And I just wanted to quickly go through a few of, of the projects that we've been working on really quickly with United Realities, which is our VR company. Um, and we've been focusing mostly on, on um, art and music, and that just happened through the, um, the interest of our partners. So, uh, and I think also kind of just seeing that those media, you know, kind of fashion and, 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 and art and, and music I think they really lend themselves um, to to VR, and I can also avoid a lot of the problems that you have with uh, real storytelling. So I guess it's just an easy way out. Because uh, I've been also listening into some of the um, the panels here that all deal with you know what's the uh, you know the the, the the camera position in in kind of a storytelling um, VR experience. You know uh, all the issues that we can't. Uh, that the, the camera can't really speak and is it a character, is it not a character. Um, with music videos and, and art experiences you don't have to answer that necessarily. Um, it, this project Odyssey was an art, ex, uh, art installation that we did for the London Design Festival. It, um, this is a physical sculpture that we set up in a space and the interesting part about this was you know that also kind of that we wanted to create an interface that you engage with so to really enhance the experience so you sit on this turbine um, the turbine itself had some sensory layers integrated into it um, a butt kicker or an, uh, uh, you know which is integrated into the seat and which um, converted um, sound into vibrations and then we also used a sub pack um, same thing, it really kind of makes the, the sound design of the whole experience really um, a body sensation. And we also had wind integrated into it. And really just trying to figure out how we can immerse people more by adding more of those layers. Um, the other thing is also kind of by having this sculpture um, that the experience really starts in reality. And if you um, look at this upper build, uh, uh, image, that's um, the first image basically as a VR image that you see once you go into experience is a recreation, a scanned 
version of the space that the sculpture was set up in. So again, kind of interweaving the physical and, and the virtual uh, for this experience. And you also, you know, then the experience starts from the space, the space transforms and um, we go into a different world and in the end we land back into the space. So it's kind of really thinking about how can we create an experience that picks you up in reality, takes you somewhere else where you can't go in reality and brings you back and grounds you and kind of really uh, creates kind of a story, um, yeah, again, that kind of really has a, has a departure point and an ending point. And this was a music video? This wasn't a music video, this was an art experience. Um, so we had sound with it and you basically went from the room, the, you know, the ceiling opened up, you went into this imaginary landscape and then you were pulled out into space and uh, landed back in the space. Um, for the weekend, this is a music video for the weekend that we did. Um, same thing, and I guess that's kind of also what, what I wanted to, um, you know, kind of my point of view is kind of we, a lot of times we start with um, the space as a storytelling element in, in all our experiences. And so that's kind of my perspective coming from, from architecture and spatial design. Um, you know, the, the camera most of the times is very static and uh, your approach would be probably completely different. Um, but we, you know, usually kind of place the camera and do uh, very minimal movement on it because there's a lot of movement that you can do with your, with your head. And um, then really kind of think about how can we create clues in the space through sound and through visual elements that really tell the story. So again, really kind of um, putting the spatial design, the production design um, at the core of storytelling. And um, I think that that almost kind of allows you, you know, to take production design to the next level, um, you know, if, if we compare it to, to uh, regular features or, you know, 2D 2D um, storytelling. Um, the Untamed Impala experience, it's a project that we're currently working on. It's for the band Tame, Imp uh, Tame Impala and it's a music experience which again does the same thing as the Odyssey. It starts with a recreation of the same physical space that the experience takes part in and then weaves together and takes, takes uh, that as a departure point. It's um, kind of a music experience where we've got these crazy psychedelic uh, impalas um, making all these Busby Berkeley inspired dance formations. Um, so in this case, you know, going back to maybe to my point of, of, of the spatial design, it is, you know, we started this really with kind of how can we create like a really cool psychedelic space. On the left side, you also see how the dome that we start in uh, disintegrates and then really um, leaves into this more kind of uh, uh, unlimited kind of universe. And the impalas themselves, they create all these Busby Berkeley uh, formations that for me are also kind of spatial. You know, they, if you look at this image, it really kind of creates these perspectival uh, configurations that are, um, yeah, hopefully quite interesting. Um, yeah. And this is kind of the last project um, that I just wanted to talk about, which is from The Folds, uh, another music video um, where we just set the camera down into this, you, you know, it's hard to see, but it's, it's, it's kind of this social housing um, in, in London. And the band was just kind of um, arranged around the, the static camera. And the, the singer and the band were kind of multiplied several times. And, you know, we kind of, just told the story with that and different people are coming out of the entrances of the buildings and kind of just animating and kind of thinking of it as a as kind of a circular theatrical space. Um, and I wanted just to also look a little bit into the future of what, what we're, um, you know, kind of looking into at the moment. As I said earlier, our company, Optimist, that is kind of the, the bigger sister or bigger brother company to United Realities is doing a lot of brand experiences for Nike and Google and Facebook. Um, and I'm really excited also from an architectural point of view, you know, what will happen once the whole internet is, is three-dimensional and VR and once we're kind of able um, to basically think of all the, the web pages as three-dimensional spaces, you know. So once we kind of go on to Nike.com 
and you have the most amazing flagship store online um, in you know that you can kind of visit and and then it goes back also to what I said earlier the idea of kind of creating a space but also telling stories in it will then probably be in its in its purest um, kind of incarnation because you know like you can then create like the most amazing flagship store for Nike you can put let's say in one area you go into the basketball area you sit down with LeBron he's kind of explaining you his latest shoe so that's all storytelling you know he clicks with his finger uh, a basketball court that is you know <laughs> super futuristic and like Space Odyssey 2001 comes up and um, he basically starts throwing uh, hoops and you know while he's doing that you see all the stats of you know that really kind of made up um, the the technical data that Nike uses kind of to create a shoe like that so I think and that that all happening in a, in a beautifully designed space or um, Amazon 3D as a VR space um, you know well that's what I learned and I always uh, yeah anyway but uh, you know or Amazon 3D you know kind of a super cool gigantic space where you can sit down with Oscar Wilde and he's talking about one of his books instead of reading reviews you, you know you talk really to the people uh, to the writers and everything and I think there's just so much more to come that is just really exciting on on a lot of different uh, frontiers and I think just you know from an architectural point of view but also from a storytelling point of view I think uh, there will be a lot to explore so many things over the course of this week what happens when we have a 3D web page, three-dimensional web page? Thank you. Um, do we place our HoloLens avatar inside the 3D <laughs> web page and be surrounded as well with augmented images? Maybe. Come on, hit the line. Let's see, and then look, we didn't have to reboot. <laughs> Outside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I came from the theater world uh, as well as dance, and uh, this was uh, working on Invisible with Doug Lyman, uh, 30 Ninjas, Condé Nast, Samsung, and John was my first experience in working in VR. Uh, but before that, as somebody experience, experiencing it, I was, is there a vocabulary word for somebody that looks the other direction than the action that you're supposed to look at? Because uh, <laughs> I, I wanted, I really wanted to hunt. I wanted an opportunity to, to hunt and maybe, hunt and maybe uh, discover something that other people weren't gonna see. And uh, that really excited me from, um, from a production design standpoint, is that um, we always dress a set in 360 but to think that people might want to roam to learn more about the characters uh, and you know more about their past and their connection with the other characters and all the conventions uh, that we usually use in filmmaking to create a set, uh, that they could really focus on details that they choose to look at and that the camera isn't just telling them what to see. Um, so that was really exciting for me. So when I got this call to work on this, um, I have to say the interview process was really interesting, putting on the goggles mid-interview and being so disoriented after <laughs> having them watch me with the goggles on. It's always fun. Uh, but um, I was really interested also in maintaining the intimate connection between the the director and the production designer and the DP and really trying to follow through with the, the concepts and uh, the emotions and just the overall st storytelling between characters um, despite all the, you know, the, the exciting technology. And um, it was great to work with such a, he had such a large technical kind of camera department that was ad, ad led and we had that, uh, you know, we were able to, I think, work together to maintain the continuity and the, the conventional relationship. But it was really interesting as we went to hear people say, like, 
oh wait, here's this way of using the technology that's gonna put that, um, just on the day, that's gonna put that through, that idea through even clear, more clear. Um, I thought it was interesting how the art department becomes responsible for lighting the set. And uh, so all of our table lamps and uh, all the lighting around the room suddenly is, is lighting the action. And uh, what I would have liked is, uh, just looking back, it would have been great to have more time with blocking the scenes in, this, in the dressed uh, set on location and really discover where the actors are gonna land so I could work with Ed and um, Jeannie and, and um, customize our you know, set dressing to really help, uh, to help on their end. Um, <laughs> yeah. We didn't do as much as we'd like. We did a camera test and we did some of that, did some but of that, I feel like I feel like we, that could go further. If we had more time, it would have been great. You're, you're doing it times 15. Yeah. <laughs> three practicals, you've got 15 but or 20. I, I just, for me, I really enjoy it, and it's funny now when I go on scouts. I do mostly features, uh, and now when I go on scouts, I'm like looking so much at the ceiling and on the floor and like really just you know everyone you know might talk about like angles on a scout especially a tech scout and just thinking about myself like I'm in the middle of this room and every point you know every I'm gonna see everything and um, I think that uh, in Invisible it was really important uh, it was about um, uh, uh, an Upper East Side old money family and we had all these amazing locations but one of them was this uh, mansion that had I mean part of the reason we chose a location it has the most incredible ceilings uh, high ceilings and beams and uh, floors and every detail um, but I think moving forward I would really like the opportunity to build sets and I do recognize that with a location you have so many built-in details uh, so many built-in details with the architecture and and the items that the person already has oftentimes we're maybe using some of them or we're clearing out everything and bringing in our own items but there's so much in a living space that's real that i think lends itself to working so well for virtual reality but i think that it would be really fun to to build more sets and also try to accomplish that same goal so right. thank you begin the world. I think we're dealing here a lot with understanding the relationship between the natural physical world and um, oops, I went off of that. What I'd like to do is take a few questions. I was going to mention that as I've seen various iterations of technology earlier, um, earlier uh, times at virtual reality, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of build and development to it and didn't fully take off, it feels a lot more real this time. I've also seen a lot of other iterations, whether it was interactive television, uh, transmedia, boy, was that the buzzword about three or four years ago, nobody wants to you know, touch it anymore. In fact, interactive was like that, we can't call it, we couldn't call the uh, interactive media workshop, really, that at AFI, we couldn't use that word, Intel did not want us to use that word. So they came up with the enhanced television workshop. So I think we have to look at this medium, all of it as being tools and grounds to work with to um, build creative, new, you know, make new stories and create new environments and experiences. One of the most sophisticated tools that's ever been out there to me is the pencil. You think about what's involved in making that, the industry, forestry, mining, <laughs> the manufacturing, the distribution of it, and it requires very little of a learning curve. And you can draw, you can write, um, it's very intuitive. And I think that's what I'm hoping we'll start moving towards with this medium. Questions, please, for any of our panelists. Yes, Phil. more about hiding cables. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oftentimes we're always the, hiding cables on set. I mean, you're kind of doing what you're doing on a normal set just times 15. Um, so you, 
you know, you can replace your, you, you get practicals at work, they're motivating sources, you can replace those bulbs, you can make them bigger. Um, we used a lot of uh, like LED strip lights that you could hide like behind something. Um, this type of VR really, this type of show, I mean, we established a look for it, really lent itself to a lot of like light could come from anywhere. You, 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 a certain aspect, it's like if you've got a lamp on a table and you've got a character here and you put something here, it, it doesn't have to be nearly as accurate uh, for us to buy it. Um, that and lights outside, like you put a condor up where the sun is. Yeah. out of the way and shoot the light in. Something I was so impressed with Ed and his team about, uh, I mean, we had a limited time frame to shoot everything. And, and in terms of fighting the light throughout the day, like he didn't, we didn't, we couldn't always choose when and where we were going to be shooting. Oftentimes we were shooting three units and hiding mm. from cable cameras in every room, every window. Um, There's a reason for that cliche yeah. about losing the light. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You're on a but budget. He really made it work. You're on a budget. Yeah. You've got a certain amount of time, and suddenly you've got to shoot multiple locations. And you, you're at that point, you're really psyched. You have six or seven people in your camera department, but you've only got three or four or five people in your grip and lighting department. Last week they were shooting. It's always sunny in Philadelphia outside my loft on the one of the only cloudy days we've had all year. <laughs> By the afternoon, the sun came out, and I said, "What did you do?" Must have done something. Another question was here and then here. Yes. The question is, can you talk about, um, have you explored any sort of narrative at all of augmented reality? Um, anything that's got a, a timeline to it? Than like no, I haven't. Um, my interest is mostly um, as an artist, as a sculptor, and then I also do the prints. Um, so I'm definitely not interested in doing narrative. Um, I think it's going to get more interesting. Augmented reality is getting to an interesting point right now where the technology in your camera is able to see stuff um, and know that's a chair, like Google Tango and things like that. So it can spatially understand the room. Right now, all we can work with is you have to have that trigger there. So once we can put objects, like you can put a pet there, a bunny that can run around your house or something, you know what I mean, things that are much more exciting, um, then you can st tell more stories. Also, you're, you're, you're kind of, well, I was going to say you're kind of more fixed to space, but no, you can do augmented reality in a headset. So it would be great to have more people from the narrative world coming into augmented reality because I really think it's going to be one of, the, it's going to be incredibly powerful. Actually, yeah. Like a children's pop-up book or any of that kind of idea? It's not been my interest, so I haven't. Um, there is a there is an interactive Alice, actually. That to, to speak to that point a little bit, though, I think, AR within VR, or VR with AR within VR is very interesting. And then coming, I think AR is where we're going to very easily be able to have uh, communal storytelling experiences, like a movie theater's communal versus isolatory, or versus having to hook up with online. With, with AR, I think. It's, Speaking of, you can of, do it together. Yeah. yeah, there'll be one headset. You'll just have one headset, and it'll do both things. So it'll be very like a few time where you really want to knock out everything. You'll be seeing things in portions of your screen. But speaking of storytelling, yeah. Anna Marie just sent me a piece where um, Samsung created um, a headset for kids that they can use their cardboard and then the parent has the Samsung. Right. And they're dropped into a world and the parent is narrating the story to the kid and they're in separate locations. So It's actually titled Bedtime yeah, Stories. Yeah, so it's a bedtime story. The parent is, is away <coughs> traveling. And they're narrating this virtual world with their kid. They both have the headsets on. They're both inside. As so, a, yeah, sorry. yeah, you just have yeah. to be careful with this as anything to make sure that you're doing something that's truly unique that you have to be doing in AR or VR. So that's the thing. Like, if you're setting out to do an AR narrative, just make sure it's a story that you can't tell any other way. Um, yeah. And not just like, oh, the, pa the pages like come off and the character does something. You like really get really, really drilled down. Well, I think with all media today, really, it's also about authenticity and things being relevant, the right tool for the right job. The bedtime thing got me, you know, I really was wowed, which is why I sent it to you. And then update already on that. I had, I had mused about it, and I think I mentioned it in my class, that my husband and I used to tell bedtime stories to our children on their backs their fingers and they would ask they would say tell me a story on my back 
So we created an environment on their backs and had characters walk around. They imagined parts of the environment and I thought, how would you do that? How would you do that with this virtual reality situation? And then I met someone on a panel two days ago with Axis, uh, Axon rather, technology and they're using, they're developing haptic technology so that you can have this visceral tactile touch and so literally you might be stuck on a business trip in South Korea and your kids in Connecticut and you can enjoy and have a reason to do to use this technology and actually even have uh, some feel to that some warmth and I think that's what's important when things get so out of whack technolo technologically that we're forgetting what the the real need the real use for it and the real authenticity. Yeah, I mean, just one tiny more point. I mean, you think about augmented reality and ability to place a 3D object in your world. Mm. I mean, there's nothing more um, like collaborative and um, shared is having someone sit down at a table with you um, in that experience. You can have dinner with someone no matter where you are in the whole world and they're just a cutout, but they're in your world and you're in their world or you can be somewhere else. You know, you can have, you can go on a nature walk and be looking around and see, be seeing animals that don't exist. You know what I mean? Or that are extinct. So we can mix, yeah, we can tell a lot of stories, you know. Yeah, you could do that in Griffith Park now, by the way. Of, <laughs> yeah. A lot of film marriages. Huh? Would save a lot of film marriages. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then, and then here. To constructing a narrative in VR, what are some things that you feel like you can Things that you feel like you might spend too much time on that you discovered a very simple answer or, or, or anything like that? Are there things like that? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> there's not been nearly <laughs> enough answer. time for me. Yes, there's a gentleman here. Yeah, when, where, and how might we be able to see invisible? <laughs> in the can? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's you will, coming in 2016. Wow. Oh. Sometime this year. It's, it's a John Condon asked Samsung. 30 Ninjas project, and it, it, it is invested heavily enough in it, it'll be released. It's just, I'm not sure when they're released. And it is a narrative. And if I knew, I probably couldn't <laughs> say. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that it is a narrative. Yes, yeah. it's yeah. a narrative yeah. 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 series. We got that straight. Uh, uh, 30 series. minutes, uh, six episodes, five minutes each. Uh, six or seven episodes each. Great. Anyone else? Any more questions? It's group? No? I guess we're at the point where the future is so yesterday. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone, one and all. <laughs>